Thank you, Chairman Cook, Chairman Soliday. Uh, I'm glad to be here. It's an honor to be in Indiana. I'm from Austin, Texas, so please forgive me that. Um, I, I spent most of my career, and, and, and my slide deck will address, in the 26 years I've been practicing as a utility lawyer, both on the regulatory uh, market side and the environmental regulatory side. So I've, I've divided this presentation up. And, and each of these topics, obviously, with everybody in the room knowing so much about energy is probably itself a two-hour talk. I'm going to do what I can to be extremely efficient with y'all's time. I put more slides in, in the presentation than I will address because some of the ancillary and context, contextual issues are, are really important to understand. The first half of what I'm going to talk about is, is, a, is a fundamental flaw in the ongoing discussions. I certainly commend Indiana with this task force uh, opportunity to study these things because too few folks are really trying to understand the true and total cost of every energy resource. And I think it's an important conversation. Some key issues have already been raised today and I'll try to address those. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about reliability. I won't touch resilience. Michelle just did a good job of that. The second half is to put my environmental lawyer hat on and talk about something that has already been asked about, which is what about externalities? How should it factor into the analysis? So that's, that's kind of my game plan here. So first off, lessons learned from markets. And so each of these subheadings uh, of this slide are worthy of an hour conversation, but let's dig into it. The most fundamental problem we have when you look at whether it's polling or PR releases or even in docket discussions within public utility commissions across the country, is there is not enough transparency about the, what the true and total cost of each energy resource is to be able to take polling results and statements about solar's cheaper than coal, coal's cheaper than X. All this discussion is happening with, with really selective decisions about what's in the cost. And so LCOE analyses that we've used for you know, decades are just inadequate because they're not factoring in these system costs. And a classic example or two I will share. Um, but I really, I put the, them into two pots. There are direct subsidies, okay, that do not show up in our utility bills. They're buried in our tax bills. I think everybody knows that. I'm not going to linger on it. It's a tens of billions of dollars a year issue and there's all kinds of discussion. I hear people say all the time, oh, all fuels are su subsidized. Well, Life Powered, which you heard from Dr. Brent Bennett two weeks ago, who I work with in Austin, um, has done detailed analysis of what the return on investment of subsidization is, because it is true that all energy is subsidized. The question is, what's the return on investment? And I think the, the, the results of those studies show time and time again that the ROI on fossil R&D is certainly significantly lower than what we have on, on renewables. I'm not going to do a deep dive today on that. I'm going to leave it alone because I think the, the less understood area is the indirect subsidization of renewable energy. Okay? Transmission. It's already been talked about. I'm going to show you a specific case study of just how significant that cost is and where it will go. The second is balancing the unreliable, unreliability or the intermittency of wind and solar. The third is the resilience values. Uh, Michelle did a good job of addressing that. I'll save time and not cover that here. But a bottom line, and I think you heard this from Dr. Bennett two weeks ago as well, is the higher the percentage of penetration of renewable, the costs start to exponentially increase. And there are reasons for that in the system, and I'll try to touch upon them briefly. So this is a busy slide, and we're not going to go through it all. But it is a great example. I'm from Texas, and so when you move there, I'm not native, so I guess I just uh, am a little bit more free to do this. I'm willing to criticize my own state, maybe more than a native Texan. The reality is that the ERCOT market in particular and the experience that we have had in renewable penetration is so often cited in a surficial level as a huge success story. And there's many things that are successful about Texas and the grid, but the story of wind penetration in particular is a cautionary tale, one that every state should be watching. What this very busy slide shows you is that the cumulative transmission build has literally doubled the distribution and transmission component of a rate payer in Texas. Okay? We spent $9 billion on, a, on, a, on a, a renewable build called the Competitive Renewable Energy Zone, CRES build, to date. And then studies are showing that if we continue down this path of deeper renewable penetration, we'll spend another $14 billion. So we're talking about not small numbers, very sizable investments. 
Transmission investment is valuable. I'm a utility lawyer. I know its value. But transmission investment driven by the intermittency and distant location of renewable energy is something that's just not in as part of the discussion. Sounds like you all are discussing it. I commend you for doing it because it's, I will tell you, I was there when we were deciding about launching on this campaign and it was vastly underestimated in Texas and we're, we're experiencing those impacts now. So um, off-peak exuberance versus on-peak reality, a very important issue, okay? I mean, a classic example are, are, the, are the headlines you hear. If you were just reading national news about Texas, you would think, oh my gosh, it's incredible. And it is an amazing story that we have penetrated the Texas market so much with wind that there are times of the year where we are, and if you annualize over the whole year, we have a lot of wind production, even more than coal in the first half of the year. However, I think everyone here knows this, the system is not built on annualized percentages. It's built on peak needs. We have to have a system that can sustain itself at peak demand and at peak exposure to natural elements. And the story in Texas is an incredibly cautionary one. And these, these graphs are scary if you're a utility person, but everybody needs to understand the weight of what we're talking about. This is busy, but you basically can see the blue line is what the power that the market needed, and it cycles like everybody has seen in other charts, depending on the time of day. This is a summer scenario, right? The orange line is the wind, the wind generation. The dotted line across is how much wind capacity we have. It's a massive wind fleet, 24 gigawatts, okay, 24,000 megawatts. The average production when we need it most is just significantly lower in the single digits of percentage. And as Dr. Bennett addressed when he talked about battery storage two weeks ago, the gap between wind and solar at peak and what we need is a battery capacity infiltration that frankly can't exist based on current physics and economics. It is a far too simplified story that people keep on thinking that we can battery storage or even energy storage our way out of that problem. And by the way, this was not a, a, an isolated circumstance. This is July, this is August. We see it over and over. And that's not to say that these are resources we shouldn't build. I have solar on my house, I've supported wind generation, but we cannot underestimate the, the escalating cost as we more deeply penetrate the market with these sources. So where Indiana is now is where Texas was really a decade and a half ago, making decisions about really big, weighty, costly things, and I would simply ask, look to Texas and learn the lessons from it. And the lessons will continue to be learned as we hit both colder months and, and hotter months next summer. So not just Texas, SPP, okay? A really infamous period of time. Uh, Michelle showed uh, some examples from what happened in January. Very well known that you had a drop off significantly in wind relative to forecast. This is a slide from SPP. This is a deck they presented. A slide in the common is just significant. This is a major wind penetrated uh, uh, interconnect. I think everybody knows that, 48% okay, on December 20th, dropped to 17 in less than 24 hours, caused major system disruption. If we wouldn't have had coal, nuclear, and natural gas performing at extremely reliable levels and being able to ramp up, that would have been a major system failure. And I can say the same thing about the generation fleet in Texas. Very high performance from the thermal fleet is keeping this story from being a horror story. We can't ignore those reliability things moving forward. This is a very wonky, detailed slide that warrants a deep study. I'm going to give you the key takeaway because we have limited time. The price, the highest prices of power in Texas at peak going up to $9,000, okay, those are no longer driven in the Texas market by when we need the most electricity. They're close to our peak demand. But they're now, for the first time this year, driven by when wind drops off quickly. Wind is moving peak pricing like we've never seen it before. So this slide and the next slide by the Independent Market Monitor, which is Potomac Economics, tell a very cautionary tale. But punchline before I move to phase two is right from IMM, okay? 
Even though natural gas prices were down this year by 15%, power prices in the Texas market went up 40%. How does that happen? When you underestimate what the cost of renewable penetration is going to be in your grid. So please learn the lesson and continue to study it closely, not because I'm a Texas and I want you to study Texas, but because these are cautionary tales. And Texas, as the only other market that burns, that uses more coal generation than Indiana, the only one, is not an irrelevant example, okay? Just a slight retirement of its coal fleet has thrown us into some very dire circumstances. Please don't replicate that model. MIT states, and you saw this slide from Dr. Bennett, so I won't repeat it other than to say that it is a fact that most document that as you escalate penetration, in other words, as you drop your grams per kilowatt hour of, of power, your costs escalate because of the need to cover the intermittency issue. And that doesn't even factor in the resilience things that Michelle has appropriately pointed out. I'm going to go to part two because it's directly responsive to a, a very good question that was earlier asked, which is, what about the cost of pollution? I'm proud to say, and I, teach, I help teach at school at the law school in Austin, environmental law has worked. We identified the pollutants we know hurt people. We identified the strategies and technologies to reduce them. And over the period of the last 30 to 50 years, depending on which pollutant you track, we have systematically taken those externalities and reduce them to be in full compliance with national ambient air quality standard. The only NACs that, that, that impacts this country, other than particulate matter in the LA basin, okay, is ozone. And the stationary source, the power plant contribution to ozone has plummeted and is no longer a driver. And, and, and any environmental study that's got merit will tell you that. So what does that tell you? So there's the reductions. And we did it, by the way, when we were massively expanding our economy. The significant thing to say about all of that is that it is absolutely false to keep on claiming benefits of pollution reduction when we drop our, pollutant, our, our ambient levels below what is safe. The Clean Air Act doesn't actually establish air quality standards for clean. Clean is untethered to science. The question is, is it safe? And so, the EPA establishes standards of where our ambient air is safe, and it actually adds a margin of safety, a buffer. And because we are complying across the board, and in, in even those instances where that were not, it's not driven by stationary sources, it is false, patently false as a matter of toxicology and law to a, assign externalities in terms of benefits for when you prematurely retire coal. And that is particularly true and very troubling in states like Indiana, who have been proactive and whose ratepayers have actually spent the money to pay for the controls. Very important. And this is something important too. This isn't a, bipart this isn't a partisan issue. Red for Republican, blue for Democrat. We have reduced all of those pollutants dramatically since 1990. And by the way, that bottom red line on the chart is total renewable energy penetration. We fixed this problem with technology, not anti-fossil fuel ideology. It's very important to point that out. And let's talk about the globe. Particulate matter is still killing millions all over the world. The US example of, of, of technologies that reduce PEM and make us a shining example for the country is something that should be celebrated and exported. I, my last comment, which my limited time, is about carbon dioxide. Because I just talked about the pollutants we know hurt people. Now I'm going to talk about the pollutants people are concerned about might be driving the IPCC magic model, the model they use to estimate what the actual impacts on global concentrations of CO2 will be in 2050. That's the construct under which most of the agreements are negotiated, certainly Paris and moving forward. You plug in the emissions inventory from EIA in the table, and what you get is you get to decide how much are we really moving the needle with these decisions. And, and it I sounds a little provocative to say the world doesn't need windmills and solar panels in Indiana, but this chart tells you we can zero out the entire coal fleet. Michelle talked about north of 2% is the, is the current day percentage of the, uh, of the CO2 emissions. When you model it for 2050, it's 0.4% of the global pool. Okay? That doesn't mean we should not be doing anything, but we cannot accept economic analyses that 
claim benefits, especially large economic benefits, associated with CO2 reductions in a scenario like that. So with that, I'll stand for questions, Chairman. Questions? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You mentioned that we are where Texas was 10 or 15 years ago. So what did the process look like in Texas at that time, similar to what we're doing now, and then what steps did they take legislatively or you know, via regulation to get where they are today? So very importantly, I think most people know this, but I'll state it so everybody's on the same page, because you have a, a great state, you don't need to really pay attention to Texas. Texas deregulated its wholesale utility markets. So there are no more rate proceedings other than a couple of pockets. Um, that had benefits, clearly. It also stripped away the oversight of a public utility commission to evaluate these decisions on a system-wide basis. So although I've been an advocate for deregulation as a concept, it proves to be very inadequate in terms of system planning. If you're not factoring in that transmission cost, what happens? It's, it's decoupled. And lo and behold, you let yourself spend $9 billion, but that money got socialized to all fuels, and not a single utility had to do a system evaluation about what the dollar per megawatt hour levelized cost of electricity was going to be if they decided to shut something down and build wind, for example. That is a huge miss by us. We recognize it. Don't make the same mistake, please. And that, that, that really is the most obvious thing, is that we deregulated our market, we let the wild winds of the market forces uh, flow, and that has, has rendered some benefits, but the biggest miss, other than transmission, the impact of subsidization. I think you all know this, but when you get $23 a megawatt hour for putting wind on a grid in the form of a subsidy, and the price of electricity drops to low, and you only get that subsidy if you generate, you bid the price of electricity negative. You literally, in the Texas market, see one out of every three bids negative. In other words, paying to stay on the grid. So that has two eff effects. One, it destroys and distorts the marketplace. And two, it erodes the capital of existing thermal. Nuclear, coal, and I will tell you gas. We could spend another hour talking about how the myth that new gas is getting built. Take a look at the Texas market. See how much new gas is getting built. Close to nothing. Because people and banks are not going to invest in a marketplace where a subsidy is driving the price of electricity to below zero. Other questions? Uh, just one, I think I know the answer. Knowing Texas is their own, myself. Can Texas buy electricity from other markets? There are DC connections to the ERCOT market. And let me be clear for my SBP and MISO brother, and there's pieces of MISO and SBP in Texas. They're mm -hmm. tiny, it's about 10% of an overall market. But in that 90% that is ERCOT, we have DC ties, and frankly, those DC ties have actually proven to be quite valuable, but it is not something that our leadership, and I think even the utilities themselves, really want to rely upon as a system balancing. It just doesn't serve us uh, the kind of immediate response and capacity that we need. So that's why during the summer events in Texas, you could not control price because the, you didn't want to use the DC the or? DC connections were used, to be really clear. It's just when you're talking about a grid that's 74 gigs, 74,000 megawatts at peak, you know, setting new records in that ballpark, you're talking about very tiny influences and oftentimes in the part of the state where we don't need it because it is all, all, very much a localized need, which is a whole different system impact issue. But you could buy electrons from California. Um, not Arizona. Yeah, I would never. I actually, it, it doesn't really work out that way. I mean, there are DC connections to Oklahoma, to the east, and to the south, Mexico, but the dollar transactions are really very small. Um, it's a problem. I mean, you've identified one of the biggest exposures. It's a benefit in terms of regulatory structure because FERC doesn't really have a lot of jurisdiction, if any, on the ERCOT market. However, we are. That's why I think it's such a good experiment to study because it's isolated. It's like going into a lab and being able to control all the variables. So often, a lot of these system costs, especially of wind penetration, are socialized over such large swaths of the country, you don't see the acute impacts. In Texas, you do. I think there was one question. Dr. Carvalho. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a comment and a question. The, the comment that I uh, You mentioned that the, the true costs of renewables are hidden due to the lack of market transparency. 
I think that, that applies to a number of um, generation sources. And for example, if the social cost of carbon was internalized in you know, the gener generation markets, then the marginal cost of some resources like coal would be doubled or tripled, right? So it's because we have that in mind. The actual question is, similar to the previous witness, what are the actual changes in market rules that you need to internalize some of these benefits that coal brings in terms of resilience and, and reliability? In this case, since you're talking about ERCOT, I'd like to hear specifically about that market. You bet. Well, first of all, I absolutely accept the challenge that externalities of all sorts, even CO2, should be factored. Nobody who knows anything about accounting or economics can look at a number like that 0.4% of the global pool and tell me that the social cost of carbon calculations that are being imposed on domestic coal reductions are valid. Totally inappropriate calculation and it's one of the most unjust thing that's happening in the public dialogue right now. Those numbers are absolutely inappropriate when you're talking about a highly efficient coal fleet that's already controlled for all the other pollutants. It is not the same thing. Carbon is a global pollutant, but reductions domestically are not the same thing as reductions globally for a lot of reasons that can't go into. But in terms of market, I, I, transparency and imposition of both the deregulated and the wholesale market are very important. I mean, deregulated and regulated market. In the deregulated market, it's going to take a lot more sophisticated tools. It's going to take valuing resilience. It's going to take making sure that when we do massive renewable-driven transmission that we don't socialize those costs, that we create a different T-cost mechanism. Very tricky, okay? We also need to figure out in the regulated markets, are commissions, are public utility commissions appropriately requiring that planning function? Most are. IURC has done a great job historically. They're in the midst of some very tricky proceedings now that I would submit are going to tell the story of whether Indiana is doing it right or not. I hope they will. I'm hopeful that they will. But we've seen it in Colorado where basically Colorado Regulatory Commission had to acknowledge, yeah, this is going to cost a lot of money, but we've got to do it anyway. Because in that proceeding, they had to accept the social cost of carbon as a given. That's not system planning the way it should be. That's not transparent. We've got to get all these numbers out on the table and study their veracity, and I commend you all for the work you're doing to try to do that. Other questions? Seeing none, thank you, sir. Thanks.